Welcome back to Rural America Live. I'm Marlon Bowling with you here on Rural Radio, Sirius XM 147. Thanks for joining us. We're talking with representatives from Vermeer. One thing uh, you kind of touched on was high moisture forage. And Josh, I wanted to bring you back into the discussion here. We're seeing a trend toward high moisture forage in the beef industry. That's been popular among the dairy industry for a while now, but starting to become more popular among beef cattle operations. You might explain that. Why is that? Yeah, Marlon, we've definitely seen a trend towards baleage uh, for a variety of reasons. Um, first off, the forage is at the highest quality immediately after it's cut, and any time it sits in the field for too long, you, you slowly lose some of that quality. So the earlier you can harvest it after uh, cutting the crop, the, the higher the quality of that forage is going to be. And then the crop is also a little bit more palatable than dry hay would be. Um, you see a lot of refusal by cows um, of some of those last few stems left out of a dry hay bale that you generally do not see in some of the high moisture baleage. So there's really just less shrink as well when you're using baleage. Now that is a term that wasn't even used back when I was farming. You might define what baleage really is. What qualifies as baleage? Yeah, baleage is really just the putting together of the two words of bale and silage. So creating baleage is the process of j- just cutting and baling high moisture forage. You know, we generally would uh, would have baled dry hay, um, you know, down anywhere from 12 to 18 percent. But for baleage, we can really bale it a lot wetter than that now. Um, it really became popular um, across the Midwest and northeastern parts of the U.S. where producers can expect shorter periods of time between rainfall. And what you really see is, you know, the weatherman is not very accurate, especially five days out, but he, his accuracy goes up quite a bit when he gets two days out. And that's why baleage has really become a bigger part of people's business. Well, it used to be when I had to put hay up, you always had to make sure that it cured correctly and that you had to get everything done before you got a rain on it and get that whole process done. But is it as critical with this method of putting up hay? Marlon, actually, you have quite a bit more flexibility with baling high moisture hay. The goal remains the same, you know, harvesting and baling at the optimum window to put up the highest quality hay that you can. Putting up baleage allows you to cut hay when it's at the highest quality rather than having to wait for a long stretch of dry weather. Sometimes you end up waiting too long to cut the hay and it's not at the highest quality it could possibly be. All right. Well, Josh, why don't you expand on the advantages of baleage for our listeners that might be new to that topic? Yeah, sure. Let me break down the advantages of baleage uh, just to further explain it. First, when you harvest a hay crop and get it off a field faster, the yield of the next cutting actually increases. So the University of Wisconsin has some research showing every day you drive over a field of alfalfa after you mow it, you actually lose 6% yield on the next cutting. So for example, let, let's say you uh, you move the bales off the mowed field two days later, you can expect a 10 to 12% yield loss on the following cutting. But if you wait five days for, for dry hay, you actually can lose up to 30% yield on that next cutting. You'll also see less leaf loss when the material is baled wet. The leaves have most of the protein content of the plant, uh, therefore, the wetter the forage, the higher the crude protein content will be. And the last thing I'd really like to mention is regarding the, the advantages of feeding the baleage. It's definitely more palatable to all the cows out there. I'm sure many of your listeners have experienced hay left in the bunk. And one of the reasons for that is the stems tend to be pretty dry and they don't taste very well to the cows, so they'll, they'll tend to leave those for last. Well, it seems that there are several advantages to baling high moisture hay. Just wondered, does this bring about additional costs for the producer if they want to go this route then? Yeah, there's some additional costs to the system. Um, if you're just getting started, the two main areas of cost are, of course, the equipment and then the plastic uh, that's used. You know, first, when it comes to the equipment, it's the baler. Um, it's really ideal to have a baler specifically designed for high moisture forage. These balers feature typically a robust pickup assembly, heavy duty pickup tines, and pre cutting knives, among other things, depending on the brand. The specialized equipment will make a significant difference in terms of performance, feeding, and increased palatability to your feed product. So in Vermeer's case, do they specifically make a specialized baler just for these high moisture crops? In Yeah, we absolutely do. Um, we offer two baler models designed specifically for silage baling, our 504 Pro and our 404 Pro. Uh, they, both, they both have the features I just described of a heavy-duty pickup assembly, heavy-duty pickup tines, and a pre-cutting knife system. Both balers can also put up dry hay if a producer desires that as well. You can learn more on our website, vermeer.com, or you can contact the local Vermeer dealer for more information on either of those products. All right. You mentioned the 504 Pro and the 404 Pro. What's the difference between those two? Yeah, the, the 504 Pro is more of a traditional baler we would see here. With It's a variable chamber belt baler. Um, it makes a 5-foot tall by 4-foot wide bale. 
Um, and the 404 Pro is something that you see uh, a little bit more in, in uh, European style of hang um, with a fixed chamber baler with rollers in it. And that baler makes a four foot by four foot bale. All right. So other than these particular balers, are there other investments that producers need to consider if they want to go that route and put up some high moisture hay? Yeah, the next thing you really need to consider is a bale wrapper of some sort. Um, there's multiple options on the market today, um, but the most popular machines are found in two different categories. You've got your individual bale wrappers and your inline bale wrappers. And the obvious difference between them is the individual bale wrapper is going to wrap a single bale at a time. Um, those bales are individual package after they're wrapped. So those bales can be handled and transported a little bit easier. Um, on the other side of it is the inline bale wrapper, which is going to wrap bales in a line where they're going to be stored and fed. So a lot of the times people see these big white tubes in the field, and a lot of times that's what that is going to be, is an inline bale wrapper that made those bales. But we do have one listener asking uh, if you could actually walk us through some of the advantages and disadvantages of inline wrappers compared to the individual wrappers. I know basically they're both made for different concepts of this, and they both have their own advantages, I guess. Yeah, there's several things to consider when making a bale wrapper decision. Um, If you start first with cost, so the initial size of the investment versus a long-term cost efficiency, this gets into more than just the wrapper itself, but a producer needs to look at all the costs associated with the machine. The daily forage requirements for your dairy or beef operation, how many bales a day are you going to be feeding and, and what's required for your operation? How do you plan to feed the baleage and do you feed it all in one place? And then finally is speed. How fast do you want to be able to wrap the bales for your forage needs? Um, Is speed a factor or are you not in as big of a hurry as you might be? So if you're considering what you would call a large-scale dairy operation, for example, what would classify it as large-scale in your mind? Yeah, sure. So anybody who's going to be wrapping um, over 500 bales, I would certainly put in that large-scale you know, what doesn't really depend as much on the number of cows you have, but more on the number of bales you're going to be putting up in a year. And in that case, you would prefer the inline style then? Yeah. So some advantages of the inline wrapper includes that it really reduces the amount of plastic used. Because you're only wrapping the outside of the bale and not the ends of the bales, um, you reduce that plastic almost in half. Um, it definitely wraps a lot faster than an individual wrapper. You can wrap up to 120 bales per hour versus 40 to 50 bales per hour with an individual wrapper. And it's definitely more practical for those larger operations like you mentioned. How did the costs compare between those two? The cost of the inline wrapper is definitely going to be a little bit more than the individual wrapper. The inline wrappers generally start around that $25,000 to $30,000 range and can go up to $45,000 to $50,000 versus an individual wrapper is going to start at about $12,000 and can go up to about $25,000. All right. Now, I did have a question for you. When you talk about these inline wrappers that you have, what happens when you open up the end cap on that? Uh, How soon do you have to use the hay after that point? Yeah, you definitely don't want to be waiting too long to start using that hay and keep that end exposed to the air. What we generally like to tell people is you want to be taking at least one bale out every one to two days. Uh, By doing this, it really ensures that the bales don't spoil. Uh, The longer that next bale in the tube is exposed, the higher the likelihood is that it will begin to spoil. Also, with with wrap bales in a line, you really have no ability to stack the bales, so they require more space. The other thing to think about when you're doing inline bales is you want to keep those bales really uniform so that that tube doesn't have a lot of uh, jogs and jags in the plastic there. And then finally, I think when you're looking at inline wrappers, the one other downside you want to think about is it's less portability. So if you're going to be marketing bales or selling bales, you're really going to want to look at more of an individual wrapper versus an inline wrapper because moving an inline bale is, is much more difficult. That's some good points. Now let's flip the coin and talk about the individual wrap bales. And how would you compare them with the pros and cons versus the inline variety? Yeah, the initial investment definitely is roughly half the cost of an inline wrapper. They tend to be a little bit more practical alternative for producers um, if they're feeding less than one bale of hay per day or if they're maybe going to be wrapping less than 500 bales per year, or if somebody wants to be sharing some of the equipment, that sometimes works better as well if you're sharing equipment with a neighbor. And then the other thing is just looking at um, an emergency alternative to dry baling. So if you're generally doing a lot of dry baling, but the the thunder clouds are showing up and you want to get your hay wrapped before it gets rained on, um, you're not going to be wrapping a lot of bales. You know, that individual wrapper works well for those producers as well. 
But on the other hand, if you have an individually wrapped bale, at least that would have been uh, similar to what I would have put up on our farming operation when I was back there. I would think that if you're having to maybe sell some at the end of the season, they would be easier to market, wouldn't they? Yeah, absolutely. Um, individually wrapped bales are more marketable. You do see some uh, individually wrapped bales going down the road, bought and sold a little bit around the county or around the state. But you also have more flexibility and options for sorting and feeding compared to inline wrappers. Um, if you know what the feed value of it is of some of your individual bales, you can kind of sort the, the better ones out to feed to your better cows and maybe the, the lower end bales out that way uh, versus an inline wrapper. It's a little bit more difficult to do that. There's definitely less potential for spoilage as well with an individual wrapper. If you get a tear in an inline wrapper, you want to get out there right away and fix it versus a, an individual wrapper. Yeah, you, you still want to go uh, fix that bale right away, but if it does spoil, you're only going to spoil one bale and not the whole tube. And then you also save a little bit of space potentially with an individual wrapper because you can stack them up versus an inline wrapper. You know, it's only one bale on the ground at a time, so you're going to take up a little bit more space. Do you have any trouble with them tending to uh, <laughs> roll away, if you will, just because of the relative slickness of the plastic compared to just the bale on bale touching? You know, with an individual wrapper, you generally see guys stacking them on their ends on the flat side. Um, and that's a good thing to do as well. If you think about an individual wrapper, how it works, you're going to get more plastic on the ends than you are on the outside of the bale. So you want those ends tipped down so that you don't get pokes through that plastic like you would with a bale that's not wrapped as much. That's excellent information, excellent stuff. Seems like a, a lot to consider, especially when you consider the costs between uh, the inline version versus the individually wrapped versions out there. Have these costs changed very much here over the years or not? Yeah, not, not as much as you'd think. You know, there's always new models being introduced and new features being inter introduced. And as, as those new models come out, you know, you see the prices changing a little bit. But over the years, I think the price between an individual wrapper and an inline wrapper have remained fairly constant as far as the, the difference between them. Other than the costs that were just mentioned a little bit ago, uh, are there any other things, any other costs involved that producers need to be uh, taking into account here when they assume one system or the other? Yeah, the last thing you really want to consider is the plastic used to wrap the bales. You know, high-quality plastic is often overlooked by those just trying to get by. Um, you really need to purchase plastic film that contains ultraviolet inhibitors to ensure that your forage is preserved and the plastic doesn't break down after several days of direct sunlight. And one thing to, to help that is to orient um, an inline wrapper north to south so that in the morning time it's the east side of that plastic sees the sunlight and on the afternoon, it's the west side. So you're really splitting the amount of UV rays that are hitting that plastic. Wow, you guys have looked at all the angles. That's fascinating that uh, you actually pegged that out, too. I'm assuming that there are probably several different grades of plastic that you can get. And I would imagine maybe it's a case of you get what you pay for these days. That's absolutely right. I mean, obviously, Vermeer does carry some plastic. Our dealers do have some sort of plastic that um, is distributed. We do not have our name on on plastic yet, but that might be on a list somewhere. It's definitely something we'd like to look at in the future. All right. Well, we look forward to that. Thank you, Josh. Appreciate that very much. We're talking with Vermeer on a special edition of Rural America Live. We'll be back right here on Rural Radio, Sirius XM 147, right after these messages. 